Hey, today we're going to look at uh, this simple passage of praying like Jesus. We're in a series titled, Lord, you know, Teach Us to Pray. One of the things that you're going to learn today is just how often Jesus prayed, how much he was just prayed about every single thing, what you and I might consider little or big. He was a man that was fully, constantly praying. Now, God, Jesus was fully God and fully man. Now, some of you may hear that for the first time, either watching or being in the room, you think, well, that seems a little confusing to me. How can somebody be all God and all man? So let me just uh, outline a brief theological principle. We believe the scripture teaches, we believe historically, we believe that God has revealed himself and God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. They existed before all of time. God existed. He wasn't created, not any part of that. He existed. He was God. Everything starts and ends with him. He's the alpha, the omega. He's the beginning, the end. And so this triune being, God in three, three in one, is God. God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Yet when Jesus came to the earth, it says he left heaven. He came as a servant, listening to the voice of the Father. And when he came, he was bound by all the things that happened on the earth, like being born as a baby. And we have a couple of babies in the room today. And welcome, we've been praying for you and it's such a gift. Hey, let's applaud and be prayerful for these families that are raising these infants. It is a joy to have you guys here today. I know lots of folks online would love to just rush into the room and get to hug all the babies. So let me encourage all of us to be a bit COVID sensitive. Don't run over and just hug and kiss mom and the baby. If they allow you that in their right timing, they will give kind of an indicator of how to do that. Until that time, we're going to just be uh, socially aware and be sensitive to them. But just as Jesus walked as a baby and began to grow as a young man, there were limitations in his life because he had to sleep, he had to eat, he got fatigued. He was working in his, in his father's uh, uh, carpentry shop and he hit his hand with, uh, with a hammer of some sort. It bled. He broke the nail on his hand. I mean, that's who Jesus was. And so he was constantly praying to the heavenly father. And as he was growing, he realized that's where his, his instructions were going to come from and his power was going to come from. And it helps you and I realize, man, we need to do the same. I mean, Jesus was God. He was fully God. And yet he was fully man. And as man, we have to realize, man, why are we not praying about every single thing in our life? And so today we're going to look at Jesus' prayer to the father. And I praise ultimately for you and I, I prayed for himself. And I pray that it might encourage us praying like Jesus. So let me just welcome you. If you're here for the first time, some of you are coming back. You've been here a time or two. Some of you are coming back from college. It's good to see you guys. We're thrilled that uh, you're here and want you to always know you're loved. We're praying for you long distance, whether it's long distance to Tempe or to Prescott or to any place else in the world. We're grateful for what God is doing in your life. Hey, I'm pumped that uh, this room is growing and I just came from our children's beer area where kids are running around in the, in the floor. They're, they're on tri tricycles and fun stuff, and they're having a good time. We have uh, our Wellspring kids that have opened up today. And all of you as parents and those who are watching, as you get more comfortable, we are just uh, so committed to having clean rooms, totally prepared, being sensitive to all of the things that you as a parent would want to be sensitive about. But I would tell you, I'm so thankful for Debbie Alvarez and our team and so many folks that are working. And oh yeah, amen, amen, I'm praying for them. But we're growing as people are able to get out and be a bit more public, and we are growing online. We had our largest membership class two weeks ago on a Thursday night. Many people joining Wellspring Church and some who've never been in this place. They've just been part of us online, and man, welcome. You're fully engaged, and we're all unified in the gospel. So if you're a guest today, welcome to a church that God is at work, growing in the West Valley, united with other churches in the West Valley for the glory of God so that people might know who Jesus Christ is, the one true Lord Savior. And I pray that in your heart, you know who he is today. Now, there's one thing that we value big time at Wellspring Church, and that is life groups. We value that people are connecting in smaller groups. And so you're going to look around the room. There'll be more instructions for those online and those in the room today about starting our life groups. And those begin today. Some of you will be in people's homes tonight. Some of you will be in my home tomorrow night. Throughout this week, we're going to be in lots of places. And so many life groups. We've added another life group uh, this uh, month. 
We're excited about that, but because we believe life groups are so important, I wanna invite a few people to come to kind of the front with me and help answer some questions that you and I might have about life groups. But before they come, I want everybody to hear me very clearly, those who are watching, those who are in the room. If your schedule is such, potentially it's the need or care for a child or a parent, the need for your job, it might be any number of things. If you decide, man, Lord, there's only so much time in the week and I'm gonna have to choose between a Sunday morning experience or my life group. I want you to hear your pastor say this, I want you to choose your life group. Okay, did you hear me say that? Because in your group, in a smaller setting, you're gonna be challenged. You're gonna be pastored by life group leaders in their homes, praying for you. You get a chance to actually talk and they know your name. You get to ask questions around the word of God. People are praying for you, walking alongside you when life happens. That didn't necessarily get to happen in a large room with lots of people every Sunday, but it will happen in your group. And so I want you in a life group. And we're starting this week and the weeks to come, and people are inviting, and we want you to know you are invited into a life group, and so if we've missed you in any way, man, you're invited now. I want to invite a few folks to come to the stage. I'm gonna ask them a few questions. We're gonna stand right down here. People online are gonna continue to watch. I'm gonna ask Doug and Sandy Hoffpower, Kim and Tony Diggs. Tony's gonna join us on video here in a minute. We've pre-recorded him. Why don't you guys come on up? Hey, let's welcome them, and some of you, yeah. Some of you are in their life group. I know Tim and Kyle and Crystal, and if Leah was here, she'd be here. If Tony was here, he'd be here. They're part of the life group that happens. All right, a little true false real quick. All right, I'm not the best audio-visual guy. You guys stick close together. You hold the microphone. All right, here we go. I want to ask them a few questions. This is kind of like the hot seat. This is true false. I just want you to quickly answer a few questions. All right, true or false, life groups meet in homes. True. True. All right, here we go. Make sure we got our microphone on. All right. True. That's right. So life groups meet in homes, like I said. Uh, in our group, it's on a Monday night. Your life group meets Tuesday mornings at 5.30 a.m. False. False. Uh, who in the world would do that? I mean, my goodness. Okay. So your life group meets on a Wednesday night in your home. Yep. Correct. That's correct. And there's food. True. True. Yeah, Tony had a long video. We had to cut. He had a nine-minute video talking about all the food he wanted this week in his life. No, just kidding. All right. Now, um, let me ask this. Let me offer this statement. We have life groups all over the West Valley. True or false? True. True. And they meet on about five different days. True or false? True. True. All right. Um... Last question. I've got to have my life and my act together. I mean, I need to be perfect before I can actually attend a life group. False. False. Okay. All right. Hey, I want to ask two big questions. We're going to pipe in Tony on the second question. Here's the first question. Now, I'm going to preface it with this. I'm aware, well aware that, that 2020 has been unique for all of us, hasn't it? Mm-hmm. Everybody here, man, there's a book and a story to be written, and someday our Children, grandchildren, if Jesus doesn't return before then, are going to talk about, man, what happened in 2020. And there are unique things for people in your life group. There's been loss of jobs and God giving back jobs. There's been loss of health, cancer, and other issues people are walking through. There have been loss of life, dear people we love that have died and gone on to heaven. A lot of life has happened. Why in the world? Answer this question. Why is it important to be in a life group during those seasons of life? And put that mic real close so that folks can hear us. Yep. Okay, I say because um, Doug and I have been Christians a long time, and uh, life groups have just grown us, grown us together. You, we pray together. I'm a room prayer warrior, and I, it, it's we tell each other our problems and our, and we get to know each other, and you feel like you're just really part of a church, and so um, Kim had, my cousin Kim had a uh, nephew here last Sunday, and he said he could not believe how friendly hmm. this was. You bet. And, you know, we need each other. A, lo- a life group's just a simple picture of how much smaller that is, too. Instead of trying to reach 100, 200, 300 people, there's 15, potentially. Okay, Kim, there was a time you missed life group. I mean, what was that all about? I mean, you went off to the hospital for like 10 days. If 
you're not aware of that, I see you for a few of those days. COVID, everybody and their family. Kim Dix. So why was being in a group and in a church important during that time in that season of your life? Well, it was very important because I didn't really know what was happening. Um, my family was all of a sudden kind of left to fend for themselves. I was in the hospital and um, our life group just picked up. They came, they called, they had, I want to say, food set up before um, we even knew what was happening, um, before Tony even really knew that that's what he needed. Yeah, did everybody hear that? I was aware that within a couple of hours, 20 people, 20 homes committed to making sure a meal happened 20 straight days in a row. I think there were meals after that, but I was aware that happened in a two-hour period because the word went out, this group needed help, they helped themselves. The word went out to other people in the church and other life groups, and people just signed up and said, there's a time for care that needs to happen now. Okay. One of the other really important things to me was the fact that prayer went out. Um, I mean, I saw things while I was in the hospital of prayer in Las Vegas, prayer everywhere. People were texting me, even when I couldn't even respond to those text messages and saying, yes, this is really what I need. Mm -hmm. God used every single person, not only in our group, the group was instantly right there, but yeah. everybody has his hands, his feet, his everything to be there um, to help support us. You bet. So in a life group, lots of caring, lots of sharing, lots of uh, praying. I'm going to let Tony answer one of these questions. What is it about a group that helps you grow spiritually? Let's listen to Tony Diggs, married to Kim, happens to be at work this morning, so... Life group helps me grow spiritually in a number of different ways. First and foremost, you know, I have to be completely honest. There's times when I don't spend enough time in the Word, but there's accountability for that when you're preparing for your life group's lessons. So that keeps you in the Word. The other is this. Um, in the Word of God, He tells us that He allows us to go through things, not only to bring us through them, but for us to be able to use those experiences to share with other believers to help them through it. And I think because we have a life group that's so diverse, it's great to be able to see the things that older uh, couples in our life group have gone through and younger couples in our life group are going through and we're able to share those things. So spiritually, uh, I think we all get better because of that. So there you go, all right. Still newlyweds, all right. Hey, how, how, Doug, how do you see people growing spiritually because of a life group experience? You know, uh, your first question was, uh, why would we meet? Yeah. You know what? We came here a few years ago, and we knew some people uh, that we already knew, but we also um, had um, uh, people that we didn't know, but we got in life. And now I have, I have some really close friends. Yeah. I have some great friends that are part of that. They would pray for us. They would take care of us when we need. So, you know, but on the spiritual side, we, we come together, we sit down, have a meal. And we find out how you're doing at work, how you're doing this and that. And then we get together and we go over the word. And um, so we teach each other. We're mentoring each other. And then we get to go through life experiences together, like Kim with her illness. I had cancer this year. Um, we have watched people who are without employment. And we all sit around and pray and we watch God move. It is an amazing thing to get close to people and let them teach you about God while you teach them about God. Living yeah. together to spiritual life. You bet. Hey, I just can't say it strongly enough. Man, the best place for you to grow, because growth happens in a circle as you're doing all of these things they just described. It's going to happen in a group. It's why we've been committed to that from day one. It's a value at Wellspring Church. Hey, because God, one of our elders prayed this this morning, because God's the one that controls all of time, I would just encourage you, exhort you with this. Your commitment and investment of time in a life group is time well spent, not time wasted. I do believe that the God in heaven will multiply your time instead of drain you and go, uh-oh, I've just given away two or three hours. This is just a pull on my life. That's a pretty strong, bold, spiritual statement, but I believe that. Second, hey, life happens these are called life groups because people are alive in them through difficulty and life and everything that's going on, all right? 
Hey, uh, the last thing that I would uh, say about, you know, just being in a life group is this. Man, I dare you. I dare you just to, to hop in. I've never heard anybody say, man, that was a waste of every single thing. And I'm sorry to meet those people. And gosh, their food's horrible. And all. I just dare you. I used to serve with a pastor who would, man, he would double down on that. And he'd say, I just double dog dare you. So whatever it would take, man, my pastor heart just says, I know that you will have a great experience if you connect in life. Our younger generations would say, man, that's where community happens. That's the church for them. We, we are hopeful that we could grow more and more. And I'm praying, just as this last year God has brought leaders so we can start more life groups. I would tell you, I believe as we're growing as a church, more and more groups are happening. And some of you may be called to step in to host or potentially teach, or to potentially be both of those in your group. Hey, I just want to pray for our life groups, and when we're done today, you're going to have a chance to further step and get your name in front of a leader and be invited. Let me pray, and we're going to thank uh, this group for giving us a glimpse of theirs. Father, we pray, Lord, uh, our prayers to you. God, for those of us who are a bit hesitant right now, we can't imagine a night of the week or an hour and a half, but God, I pray that you'd cut through all that and take away any sense of doubt or fear and really speak and say, step in faith and trust that you'll do beyond what we'd ask or think or imagine by your Holy Spirit's power within us, Father. You'd glorify yourself, your church, as we are your church in groups. We are your people and community. May your word speak this week vibrantly to every man and woman every student that will be in a group. Thank you for this testimony today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, hey, let's thank them for their words this morning. All right. Hey, I want to look at God's word in this uh, concept of Lord, teach us to pray. Luke 11, 1 through 13, and the men I'm going to have a stand as we read God's word. But let me remind you where we started last week. Luke 11 records this. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Of all the things they could have asked for, of everything, they'd seen Jesus heal. They'd seen him walk on water. They'd seen him rise people from the grave. They said, Lord, would you teach us to pray? Whatever's going on when you're praying to the Father and the Father is speaking to you, we want that. We're hungry for that. And I said, learning to pray in the name, the powerful name of God the Father, the name of Jesus Christ, his son, playing with the spirit that's within you that he gave you. Man, letting the spirit lead in all things. Man, if you can get to that place, your prayer life would come alive. And I reminded you, your prayer life is not about this exact words, like some abracadabra. Like you've got to learn, man, I've got to learn to pray the way Pastor Chris does or the way our elders or pray Jill, the way Jill prays. You don't have to have these perfect words. It's about the purpose and the intent of your heart laid before a heavenly father allowing Jesus to come alongside you and pray on your behalf and helping you. Man, just those honest, gut-level prayers. God hears and he answers. I love what Max Lucado says. Man, our prayers may be awkward. Our attempts may be feeble. But since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, our prayers do make a difference. Hey, your prayer life matters. Don't ever let anybody say you're a horrible prayer or don't be fearful of praying because you haven't done it enough. Man, it's the one who hears that makes the difference and it's God Almighty who's on the throne. And man, I encourage us to pray. Would you stand with me now? I'm gonna read one verse, one very simple verse and those who are watching online, turn to Mark 1, verse 35, 36. I'm gonna read this first part and God's gonna teach us through this. Mark 1, 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. He left the house. He went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Thank you, God, for the reading of your word. Please be seated. Jesus prayed. Notice, Jesus prayed early. Praying early ensures several things. Let me just encourage you as you're taking notes. Some of you are using the QR code. Some of you just off to the side of a piece of paper that you have in your journal, your purse, or in your wallet. Jesus prayed early for this reason. Man, praying early helps you put first things first. 
You're not as interrupted. Life hasn't happened for the day. You get done in a day what you feel is most important. And I just want to encourage you, man, start early with your prayer life. Start early. Jesus did that. Praying early prepares you for what's going to happen the rest of the day. How many of you want Jesus to walk with you throughout the day? He's promised to do that. He's not going to take his presence away. But you're knowing that's important. To know that wherever you're walking, Jesus is with you. You need to be reminded of that moment by moment. And so praying early in the morning reminds you of that. Praying early puts a spiritual filter, kind of a template over the way you see all of life. It's the kind of structures the day for you in a spiritual setting. So ask yourself this, which is more important? Is it more important to spend a whole lot of time reading the news which right now is not very good and we don't even know what's true, false, and everything in between, right? Is it more important about the news or to get in God's word and let God's word speak? Is it more important to consider, gosh, I've got a really busy schedule, I need to get my to-do list, I need to write it three times and double check yesterday and all the above, or is it more important to listen to God who's on the throne saying, I'm gonna help order your steps today? Is it more important to listen to your family and friends and get on social media or to listen to your Savior, your Master, your Lord, guide your thoughts and the thoughts of your heart that they not be anxious, but they be at peace. They have a sense of power because of his presence, which is more important. Man, why did Jesus pray early? Well, there's lots of reasons. In a minute, I'm gonna tell you what he was praying But I'm convinced that Jesus got up early because he wanted to prioritize and put first things first. And I tell my kids all the time, the reason Jesus was able to get up early in the morning is because he went to bed early at night. I read a quote recently that said this, 70% of good discipleship is a good night's rest. And man, in a world that is pretty frenzied and stays up all night, I would just encourage us, man, the work of prayer is a good work. Man, start before you go to work, whatever it is about. Adrian Rogers, a great pastor and theologian, went on to be with the Lord, said this, the prayer offered to God in the morning during a time of quiet with the Lord is the key that unlocks the door of the day. Any athlete that it is to start knows that the start is what ensures a good finish. Let me encourage us. Pray early. Let it be the priority of your life. Do you realize that your time of prayer and devotion touches everyone that you're gonna be with that day? The time you spend or lack of it affects everyone. Parents, teachers, spouses, bosses, employees, commanders, privates, Your prayer life touches everyone. I had a pastor challenge me many years ago, and I wrote it down, and I remembered it, and it's one of the reasons, part of my life pattern. Some of you the Lord may be speaking to right now saying, it's time to crucify your nightlife in order to be alive more in Christ. And so perhaps the late night is hindering your early morning time with the Father. If that's the case, let the Lord speak to you and begin to change that. In Mark 1, 35, Jesus got up early and prayed. The Greek word there says, actually, he continued to pray. Scholars believe he may have been up at 2, 3, 4. And I'm not saying you need to get up at 2 a.m. every day, but it indicates Jesus probably had gotten up that early. And he was continuing to pray, even as they came looking to him. He said, Lord, everybody in the world's looking for you. He said, look, I know everybody in the world's looking for me. I just fed 5,000 people, men, women, and children, maybe 10, 12, 15,000 beyond that. I, hey, last night I walked up out on the sea and Peter came to me and I got in the boat and I calmed the winds and the waves. I got up early this morning to listen to what God wanted today. And so as people were running and trying to find where he was, he had separated so that he could hear from the Father. What makes you think you and I shouldn't do anything different? I mean, man, I need God as a parent, as a husband, as a pastor, as a believer, as a person living in the United States of America at a very unique time in history. I want to know what God has to say, and I need that. And so I would just encourage us, man, why are we not getting up early and first 
and spending time in prayer. What was he praying at that time? Well, because he had been taught as a young Jewish boy, the Shema, he prayed it every single day. It was memorized in his head. He'd inspired it to be written, so he knew it. But as a man, fully God, fully man, he prayed Deuteronomy 6. It's what we base Wellspring Kids ministry upon, that every family should do these things. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. But Jesus would pray that every single day. That was part of a pattern of prayer. He would pray the Ten Commandments every single day because Jews would pray that. He would probably pray the Jewish prayer book. There were 18 different benedictions. He memorized every one of them. Boys before their bar mitzvah, girls before their bat mitzvah would know these prayers. They'd been taught and trained those. It was a daily routine of prayer. That's part of what he was praying before he began praying for all the other things that was gonna happen for that day. Jesus prayed early and often. We can look in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record. Luke 5, he withdrew to a desolate place to pray. Matthew 14, after feeding the 5,000, he withdrew and prayed into the night. Luke 6, before choosing the disciples, he prayed all night. Before he walked along and said, I want you, I want you, I'm calling you by name. He prayed often. He prayed before he went to the cross and he prayed from the cross. Hebrews 5, 7. It's in your notes, it's on our screen. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of the reverent submission. If Jesus prayed early and often, I'll say it again. Man, what makes us think we could go through the day and not do it any differently? I encourage us. I want us to look at Jesus' prayer It's the longest recorded prayer in scripture that the disciples heard. Later, John was inspired to write it down. It's found in John 17, and this will be the bulk of the remainder of our teaching today. It's well worth studying. I'm just gonna highlight three simple places. It's called the high priestly prayer. If you wanna turn to John 17 and make uh, just a note, this is the way Jesus prayed to his father for himself, for his disciples, and for you and me. Jesus prayed 2,000 years ago for you today. Because he's God, he knew this day would come that you would be hearing this prayer for you. By name, you're in this prayer. You're in the Bible right here. I want you to notice in John 17, Jesus prays for himself. Verse one, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven, he prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Well, that's quite a statement. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. You know, it's one thing for Jesus to pray that prayer, but if we're to pray as Jesus prayed, that's pretty presumptuous for us to pray, isn't it? Lord, glorify me today so that I might glorify you. That'd be pretty hard prayer to pray. It seemed like, oh my, Lord, am I asking for something that you wouldn't want me to pray? Let me remind you what this says, and perhaps, perhaps you'll learn something today that as Jesus prayed, you say, Lord, how could I learn from that and it encourage my own prayer life? Glorify simply means to lift up, to magnify, to exalt. It means to make large. Richard Blackaby says it this way. suggests that Jesus was essentially saying, Lord, put a magnifying glass over me. When people look at me closely, may they be impressed with you, God. Think about that. What if all of your life was magnified? Would it point to God? Would people celebrate his name and who he is? I mean, let's be candid. The world watches our life. If you want to become a pastor, you live in a glass house. It's amazing. Everything I say and do and think and be, somebody's watching, but yours is the same. If you're a coach or a teacher, a business person in the military, a neighbor, everybody's watching. And so, what if we were to pray, Lord, 
today magnify whatever is going on in my life so that you might be glorified, Father. What if you were to pray that? You know, it's one thing to live a comfortable life. It's honorable to live a life that's exemplary. But it's a whole nother thing to live a life that inspires people to know and trust the one true God. Could God want that in your life? If you said, God, I know I'm not worthy. And God, I know at times my life is a mess. But God, if for your glory, you'd want to magnify whatever's going on in my life today for your glory, God, have your way. And as a word of encouragement, I want to tell you this, man, as I pray for you, there's so many times I just pray God would give you strength, God would give you favor. I know that if you're a principal or a teacher or a coach today in our education system, man, all of your students, every parent, the school district, everybody's looking at you and saying, what do you stand for? And as you stand for Christ and as your faith is bold, people are going, there's something different about those people. I need to ask them about that. If your home has been blessed with a child that has special needs, if you're caring for a parent that has special needs, if there are things going on in your world right now and the world's looking saying, okay, let's see if their faith is gonna stand up with that. I'm praying for you and others are praying for you because they're watching and your faith shines the greatest when life is the most difficult. And people are wondering, are they gonna give up? Are they gonna quit because life is hard? No. God, magnify what's going on in their life for the God, the glory of God. And may God give you strength. When you walk through cancer, when there's death that occurs, when you lose your job, when relationships get difficult, those are the times you say, God, if for your glory you'd be magnified, please do that, Father. I'm praying for you, and I just want to exhort you. Stay strong. Keep the faith. Trust the Lord. He knows exactly where you are and wants to strengthen you today. Don't give up. The Lord is walking, about to walk through the greatest test in history, and he's praying literally hours before he's abducted and ultimately going to be taken to the cross. And he prays this prayer, Lord, whatever you want to do, exalt yourself, and so magnify me. Well, the cross certainly did that, didn't it? The single most defining moment in history, when a man was beaten and taken to a cross, and ultimately our Savior stood and took the sin of the world upon himself. That moment was so magnified, the world has to respond to it. You and I have to today. The world has to respond to that. God answered his prayer. <clears throat> Here's the last two things that he begins to pray as he prays for his disciples and as he prays for others. He says, Lord, these believers, people who have trusted me by faith, who are obedient, they have the knowledge of me within them, he's gonna pray two things. He knows that we're going to need them. One, he's gonna pray for protection. Protection from the enemy, the evil one, the one that wants to kill, still and destroy. He's gonna pray for unity among believers. I want you to notice as he prays for his disciples, he says, Lord, protect them. John 17 Verses 11 through 15. I'm going to take a, just a few things out of here. Holy Father, protect these disciples, is who he's praying for. Protect them by the power of your name, the name that you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Now I'm coming to you now, but I say these things. This is verse 13. That while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. If I have given them your word and the world hated them, for they are not of the world anymore, that I'm not of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Now this is a place where there's a lot of tension. It's one of the most difficult and negative aspects of being a believer in a world that doesn't applaud all of our faith. You and I are in the world, we're not of it. Saved by God's grace, his spirit's been placed within us to seal the salvation that he's given us. We're not of this world anymore. We long to be with our heavenly father. We long to go to a place where it's a lot easier, but he says, I'm gonna keep you there for a reason. And you go, oh, man, it'd just be easier, God. I want you to notice this. It'd have been easy for Jesus to say, now for every believer, make their life easy. He doesn't say that. Lord, I want you to protect them and strengthen them while life gets more difficult. That was Jesus' prayer. And so as he's praying, we go, oh my goodness, 
Later, John uh, records in John 15, hey, I've told you these things so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. I'm leaving you in the world for a reason. In the world. Hmm. I've given you my word. I'm going to give my spirit to you ultimately when he ascends to heaven. The spirit comes to dwell within us. And God will answer my prayer to protect you. He's going to protect you from spiritual oppression. Your life may end. You may lose your business. You may get your arm cut off or your leg. But the most important thing is your soul will never be taken. And Jesus said, that's what I'm going to protect you from. So let's not miss what the world and what the, the Lord would want us to say in his word here today. Nothing's going to rob what God has done within your heart spiritually. That's the most important. And so how do we begin to process day by day? Because most of us live quite a while on this earth before God takes us home. And this will challenge some of us. And so let me just offer this. Whatever the biblical doctrine of holiness and separation is, it seems to indicate it's not one of isolation. It's not one where he says, now that you've become a faith, isolate yourself from all the heathens and pagans in the world. Our men's ministry started to study where Paul says to Titus, his protege, I want you to go to the island of Crete. And, and by the way, I mean, ultimately, you're going to select very godly people. They're going to become elders. Here's the things that they're going to do. You're going to only plant churches all throughout this very strategic city that sits off the island. It's, it's an island that sits off of Greece. If I forgot to tell you, the men there, they're former mercenaries. Most of them are pirates. All the women, they're prostitutes. Hey, that's going to be your church. You're going to go there for the glory of God, and you're going to develop churches. And I've got a plan. If you'll follow the plan, God's going to do a great work. He's going to go with you. Most of us would say, really, God? I, I, I don't feel called to prostitutes and pirates and mercenaries or to seventh grade kids in middle school or the guy next door that every time he pulls up, he says something about me, especially on Sundays. God says, look, I'm not taking you out of the world. Go into the world. No, I don't want you to live a life that's separate. I want you to live a life that's fully integrated into life. Because the living God is within you. So go be my light, be my salt. And by the way, Jesus says, I'm praying that for you as a disciple, and ultimately, I'm praying that for everyone that will hear my voice. Jesus says, go influence in my name. Infiltrate the darkness and bring the light. Go set the captives free from the bonds of the enemy. Man, it sounds a lot like war. And some of our military men and women are in the room today. Goes, man, those are words of war. And Jesus says, yes. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I've come to give you life. I want to come and give it to you abundantly. And Jesus says in John 16, 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about all this stuff that's happening in the world. In the world, you're going to have trouble but take heart, I have overcome the world. Man, believers, stand strong in the power of Jesus Christ. Stand strong in your faith. Don't back down. Don't do anything stupid. But man, in the name of Jesus, continue to be involved where God has placed you to make a difference. So light will always push back darkness. Salt has come to bring flavor and preservation. God has called you to go be the church. Jesus is praying for the disciples. He's praying and he says, press on. Be faithful. And then he prays for you and I. I want you to notice this. Look at verse 20 and 21 of John 17. 20 and 21. My prayer is not for them alone. He's talking about the disciples. I, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. You and I are standing on the shoulders of the disciples who went to the places throughout the world. When persecution came to Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit came and they were witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And as they began to go and faith began to go through generations, 2,000 years later, we're the you who believed. That's you and I. You and I, we believe through the message of Christ that all of them may be one. He's praying again, not just to protect, that we might be unified. Father, just as you, are, you and I are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Man, to be one was Jesus' prayer. Hey, what's happened? And what's happened to unity among the, the brethren, unity among churches? 
what do you think has happened? Well, man, we sit around the, my kitchen table. It's pretty easy. Our pride has gotten in the way. We think our Bible's better than other people. We believe the way that we interpret it's stronger. We speak against them many times. We get selfish and say, well, we like our steeple more than we like theirs. Or we have the inability or unwillingness to forgive whenever we've disagreed. Jesus says, man, I want you to be one. I want you to be one in spirit, one in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about cults. I'm not talking about false religions. I'm not talking about false teaching. I'm talking about Christ-centered, Holy Spirit-led people of faith. They're all throughout the West Valley. They're all throughout the world. God would want there to be one unified big C church that we would all, Christ the head of the church. And I'm walking really close to a place where I would love to take more time and I don't have all the time today. Man, it just, it burns the heart of God. We've got thousands, thousands of denominations and names. And Jesus says there's one name. One name is the name of Jesus Christ that every church should be birthed under. And so I just want us all to realize, man, God's heart was, man, let them be one as a family. God the Father, Christ the Son, his message central. Not all the other messages we want to share. It's not all our opinions. It's the message of Jesus Christ. And we learn, man, that the body that's unified and loves is a witness to the world. And I pray that for Wellspring Church. I pray as we pray for other churches, man, be a witness to a world. And we're living in the West Valley things that needs to know a witness of Jesus Christ. There are people here that need the message of the gospel. Jesus says this, John 13, 35, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Man, let love rule for the day. Let us speak so good about that. According to John 17, would you join me in a prayer that I began five years ago? Part of it ultimately became expressed in an event we do at Good Friday. It's the day Jesus is praying this prayer. He was praying Friday before he goes and is crucified and ultimately uh, is resurrected on Easter Sunday. But we began a handful of pastors in the West Valley, and we created an event for the glory of God, for the gospel to be proclaimed, people to come together. And we said this, would you and I commit to praying that the churches in the West Valley would be unified? And that was our first commitment. Second, we said, we're going to speak well on behalf of other churches and other pastors. I'm not going to talk publicly and then behind, well, you know that pastor down the street. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna speak well every chance. Even if we disagree and even if things might be difficult at their church or even if people are leaving and they're mad and they wanna to come to Wellspring, I'm gonna speak well on their behalf. We're gonna be unified, we're gonna speak well and then I pray for pastors not to get derailed, discouraged, depressed, disqualified. Because every time any pastor or priest gets disqualified, everybody in the kingdom loses. And so would you join me in that prayer? Because that's Jesus' prayer in John 17 that they would be one, not that they'd be right, that they'd be one. And so would you join me in praying that every kingdom church in our area would thrive. Lord, teach us to pray. I wanna close with an illustration that comes from K.O. Gangle's commentary on the book of John. He describes the scene where the disciples are listening to this prayer. And he says it's almost like Dolby surround sound stereo as they're listening in. Jesus is praying in the garden. He knows he's going to the cross and he's praying this prayer. And he's praying, God, I'm praying, he's praying for himself. He's praying for the disciples and they're listening in. He's praying for all the believers in the world and those that would come after. And you can imagine how tender these men are thinking, I don't wanna miss a single word and ultimately the Holy Spirit inspires and John writes that down so you and I could hear this prayer and he tells this illustration of a group of sheep and I want you to get this image of a mother sheep a U E W E a U and her birthed lamb has died and so here's this mother sheep and her lamb has died. And the shepherd is watching because there's another sheep over here, a little lamb whose mother has died. And he keeps trying to take this little sheep over to the, the ewe that has milk and has the ability to care for this other orphaned little lamb. And every time he tries, the ewe just shuns her away and pushes this little lamb away and will not feed this little lamb. And in desperation, the shepherd ultimately realizes, I've got to do something to try to connect the dots here. And so he takes the dead little lamb and he completely takes the hide off. 
And he takes it and places the hide on the living little lamb. And he sews it on so that this little lamb is covered in the hide of this previous little lamb. And as soon as he does that, what does the ewe do? What does the mother lamb do? It recognizes every smell. It recognizes the wool on this little lamb. And immediately, it just kicks in and says, I'm going to take care of this little lamb. And this lamb, this mother lamb, this ewe, Make sure that this little sheep is alive and cares for its every single need because it now has adopted by the grace of this good shepherd this little lamb and takes care of all of its needs. So in the backdrop of John 17, I want to remind you and I of this. The father never, never turns down the prayer of the son. And so as Jesus is praying in John 17, and he says, God, magnify and glorify my life for your glory, for you, God. Could you and I pray that prayer? God, I want to pray for the disciples. Did God answer that prayer? I want you to know that of the 11 disciples, every single one of them finished strong. Not a one of them defected. Not a one of them got derailed. Even to the point of death, and many of them died a martyr's death, God answered their prayer. Well, how's God answering the prayer now? Because every time you and I pray, he smells the blood of Jesus Christ. And he takes us in and he cares for us. And he wraps us around and says, I'm not gonna let you die because of the death that's already occurred. You are mine. You have been adopted and by my grace, I'm gonna take care of you forever. And Jesus says, that's what I'm gonna do when you pray. In Jesus' name, the way I see you is not an orphaned child out there. You're my child, and I hear your voice. Do you realize that today all over the world people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ? Why? Because Jesus prayed 2,000 years ago. Because of the testimony of these 11 disciples and those who will ultimately hear the gospel, may people come forth. And right here in Wellspring and right here in the West Valley and all over the continents of the inhabited world, people are coming to faith. God is hearing that prayer and answering it. And so let me remind you of this today. I don't know what your prayer life looks like, but there are things that you've either been hesitant to lift up to the Father or you think, man, I have prayed that already three times. I would just tell you, man, never stop praying and believing that the God who hears is the one who knows what's going on in your life and he wants to answer those prayers according to his will. This past week, I would just tell you, there's two or three things. One of them was a fun thing that I'll share some other time. My life group can hear the story of it tomorrow. But I would tell you this. On Thursday, there were two men that approached me. One over the phone, one I happened to run into at the, at the gym. It was not a coincidence that I ran into him at the gym. I've prayed for these men for two years. If I were to mention their name, you know them. And they are men that have been far from God over the last couple of of years. And they've been struggling for a variety of reasons. And I've been praying for them. And I've said, Lord, would you speak for them? I've prayed for them 40, 50, 60 times. And I've said, Lord, by your will, would you do a work in their life? Would you do a work in their heart? I was so encouraged when one called and just began to say, I know somebody's been praying for me. I know that... God has heard my prayer and God has heard your prayer. Thank you for praying for me. And as he began to outline all the things, I said, God, only you could have done this. Only you could have prepared his heart to receive what you want to share for him, what he needs to hear, not from me, but from you, God. And so today, perhaps you're a parent, you're a grandparent, you're a worker, employer, and you're going, God, I'm gonna lift up my prayers again, but God, I, God, here's your prayer. God, does it work to answer according to his will and in his timing? You will go stronger if there's a delay in that prayer, but don't stop praying. Man, there's so much on prayer. So when the disciples looked and said, man, Lord, if you'll teach us to pray, that's what we want more than all. I pray that you and I would do the same. The Puritan pastor, John Knox, it was said that as he was approaching death the weeks before his death, he would ask someone to come and read John 17 every single day to him before he passed away. And let's not get to the point where we have to wait till we're right at death's door or that we're moments away and we pray with fervency. Begin now. Begin now praying just as Jesus prayed. And I would tell you, God hears 
and he's going to draw you close and do mighty things for his glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Lord, continue to teach us to pray. Lord, I pray that whatever it would take for us to rise early and pray often, we would do that. Lord, we want to be committed and united as one with other believers. Help us to be sensitive when your spirit prompts that in our own prayer lives. Lord, help us to be led by your spirit every time we pray. And may our actions follow. And God, I pray you'd encourage those in the room today. They've been so uh, drawn, adopted into your forever family. I pray you would protect them. Provide their every need financially, physically, emotionally. Most of all, remind them that spiritually they are secure in you. You've changed their name forever. And perhaps you're praying today saying, God, I need that to happen in my life. I just want to remind you, if God is prompting you now, come to Jesus by faith. Admit your need for a Savior. Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess your sin and commit, commit to following him all the days of your life. The Bible tells us in Romans 10, 9, and 10, verse 13, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I pray that if God is bringing you to salvation now, you would say, God, it's my time. And you would believe. If there's someone in the room that would say, that's my prayer right now, I want to pray with you and follow up with you at another time. But if I could pray for you because you realize, man, you need salvation in Christ, would you just make eye contact with me? Would you just look at me and say, I have never trusted Christ for my salvation. I want to now. Would you make eye contact with me right now? I want to pray with you. I want to make sure that you do not miss what God is stirring in your heart. The Holy Spirit's doing a work in you to prepare you. Just make eye contact. I want to pray with you. Is there anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love and your grace and your still small voice. And I pray for everyone at the sound of my voice that's heard your word, that they would walk with you and know of your, the security in you and the power that comes from your spirit and the promises in prayer. Guide us as we praise your name. You're worthy of that, Father. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For those in the room, would you stand? We're going to sing a song of praise for those online. Thank you for joining us. Listen to these instructions.